Yes, when, I, when Ari first asked me to give this talk, um, I wanted to be provocative, and I wanted to title it something like How I Hated Netsky, and I think Ari thought that was a little too extreme. So uh, we, turned down the, we toned down the, the title, but I really did want to get across how um, my personal odyssey um, started uh, with my not caring very much for, for Netsky and how I learnt to um, think of them in a completely different way. Um, I realised only recently that the first Netsky I ever saw in my life was in my own bedroom when I was four, five or six years old. Um, and this is, uh, there were actually two Netsky like this, very, very similar, sitting on the mantelpiece in my bedroom. <laughs> And uh, I've never discovered quite how they got there. My grandfather um, actually did a journey from Riga to Moscow uh, with the Trans-Siberian Express across to Japan and uh, back across America. He, he came the long way around in 1939 um, after hostilities had already broken out in um, Eastern Europe. And um, I have a feeling that he bought these um, two Netsuke somewhere on his journey. Um, and uh, there they were on my mantelpiece. I remember them very, very well. Um, I remember that uh, I was struck by the, the, the imagery, by the sort of, you know, by this uh, ugly little man with his octopus. Um, I was also struck by the fact that it didn't, they didn't smell very nice. They had a very distinctive and odd smell, which I didn't care for at all. And, um, you know, being a child, I also must have licked them because I remember them not tasting very nice either. <laughs> And um, as this one's lost his hand, maybe I was even responsible for biting it off. Uh, I don't remember. But um, anyway, you know, they sat on my mantelpiece and I played with them from time to time. And then I forgot about them totally. And I went off to university. I studied Russian and French. I uh, ended up in the art world. And um, I actually ended up dealing with this sort of thing. I worked for Sotheby's for uh, many years. I worked for nearly 18 years with Sotheby's, but my first... Um, incarnation there was actually dealing with impressionist and modern paintings. So although I can't claim to have sold this one personally, this was the sort of thing I was dealing in. Um, and then for reasons which are far too complicated to explain, and I don't want to bore you um, too much today, um, I ended up in the early 90s getting out of uh, Western pictures. And um, I was invited by Sotheby's to get involved with Japanese art. And as it was, a, the early 90s was a sort of nadir in uh, European, well, in world economies, and uh, particularly in uh, British pictures, which I happened to be selling at the time. And uh, work, my business was not going very well. I had my own business by that time. And uh, the idea of having something new to concentrate on was very, very exciting. And um, I'd already been to Japan in 1990 to sell pictures, and I'd been rather fascinated by it, and uh, I loved it. And um, so suddenly I discovered Japanese culture, Nihon no Bunka. So 1992, Sotheby's ring me and say, would you like to get involved in Japanese art? And I didn't let on to them that, uh, that times were hard and that I was actually desperate for a job. But uh, I played along, uh, playing hard to get, and uh, suggested to them that uh, I should spend some time learning Japanese, the Japanese language. And uh, they very generously agreed to pay me for a year to begin to learn Japanese. I promise you it's not, it's not that easy. It takes a lot longer than, than one year. But uh, at least I laid the foundation. And at the end of that year, I went into Sotheby's Japanese department, and um, I started dealing with all sorts of things that I knew nothing about. Um, I mean, you know, when you work in, a, in the uh, Japanese department of a major auction house, you're not just dealing with uh, Netsuke, you're not just dealing with ceramics, you're dealing across the whole culture. So I was dealing with swords, with sword fittings, with armor, with ceramics, with sculpture, with metalwork, um, old metalwork, old sculpture, Meiji metalwork, uh, Meiji art in general, uh, prints and drawings, uh, paintings, it's, you know, the whole gamut. And I have to say, um, when I first got involved with Japanese art, I was very enthusiastic about ceramics, and um, uh, Nabeshima, such as this, um, has always struck me as extraordinary stuff, um, that somebody could have produced this sort of design as long as goes the 17th century, strikes me as absolutely extraordinary. So. That was the sort of thing that I was interested in in my first, well, in my 10 years in the Japanese art department, uh, Japanese department of, of Sotheby's. And um, I really spent all of those 10 years studiously avoiding getting involved with Netsuke. 
Um, and there were two reasons for that. Um, one was um, my perception of Netsky, which was that they all looked like this. Um, this is supposed to be thumbs down, by the way. Um, um, the world is absolutely full of bad Netsky. There are many more bad Netsky around than there are good Netsky, um, which is a shame because Actually, there, are there is a remarkably large number of good Netsky around. I still manage professionally to find something that interests me in Netsky most, most weeks of the year and sometimes in, in some quantity. So I don't want to give the impression that all Netsky are bad. But nonetheless, my, my own first impression, and therefore other people's first impression of Netsky, may be that there's awful, an awful lot out there that is, that is bad. I mean, what I didn't like about them, I think, was I thought, I thought of them as small, uh, unnecessarily intricate, um, sort of over-fussy. Um, I, I thought that the, they were all about the detail rather than the sort of bigger picture, the sort of conception, um, the, the bigger conception. But what I've um, learnt over these last... 10, 11 years, is that that is really what, not what Netsky are about. It was my very, very good fortune to be invited after my 10 years at Sotheby's in the Japanese department um, to join one of the great art galleries for Japanese art in the world, Sydney Moss, which is now over 100 years old. Um, it's already in its fourth generation. Um, but I was invited by Paul Moss, um, the uh, grandson of the founder, to, to join him, um, and this actually this came about because Sotheby's themselves rather foolishly decided to get out of Japanese art, so I was in danger of losing my job. And um, that got me into a long conversation with, uh, long discussion with Sidney Moss, and after two years of uh, courting, uh, Paul finally persuaded me to go and work with him. And I don't think I really understood what I was getting myself in for. I thought when I worked, went to work for Sidney Moss, all I would be doing was working with the same sort of Japanese art that I'd worked with at Sotheby's. Well, not a bit, bit of it. They, they are London's oldest Asian art gallery, um, and they do both Chinese and Japanese art. But when it comes to Japanese art, they do mostly Netsuki, Netsuki and lacquer. And um, I suddenly found... Oh, sorry, I, I need to go backtrack a bit. The, the other reason that I didn't really get involved with Netsuki at Sotheby's was that I worked alongside Neil Davy, who is one of the people who has worked in Netsky the longest of anyone in the world. He was actually, he, he joined Sotheby's when he was 16 years old, and uh, he had the good fortune to be in place when the great Mark Heinsohn sold his collection of Netsky in, what was it, six or seven parts in the late 1960s, over a couple of years. So Neil got to deal with the hundreds of Netsky, very, very good Netsky from the Heinsohn collection, and eventually published them um, in in a very useful book. I think it's now a book that's become slightly um, surpassed by more recent publications, but for many years it was really one of the great standard works. It's still an important work, not least because of the, the importance of the, the Heinsohn collection. But, um, you know, I was working along Neil in the, in the 1990s, over 30 years after, actually we celebrated when I was there, we celebrated his 40 years at Sotheby's. And he had dealt with Netsky throughout that time, and therefore there was little reason for me in a small department to get involved with Netsky when I had the great man sitting next to me. But when I went to work with Paul, um, things changed. I suddenly found at Sydney Moss that I had to take an interest in Netsky. And not only did I find that I had to take an interest in Netsky, but because I was suddenly dealing with Netsky almost exclusively of fine quality, I began to appreciate what they were about. Um, now, before I came here this, this afternoon, I had no idea what your knowledge of, uh, of Netsky is, so forgive me if I cover ground that, um, that some of you already know, but I'm, I'm going to slightly assume the lowest common denominator. Um, and in taking you through a short journey on Netsky, I need to explain to you what they're about. Um, a Netsky is, is, is really, it's a, it's a stopper, if you like. It's a toggle that hangs over the belt, and it stops the, the, the Japanese, and particularly Japanese men, but women also, um, like to carry things from their belt. Now, it's commonly said that the, that the, the reason sagemono, sagemono, literally anything which has, sagemono, the word sagemono means hanging thing. And the Japanese like these hanging things, but it's often said that Japanese have sagemono because the kimono has no pockets, 
Well, it's true that the kimono has no pockets, but um, my friend Princess Takamadu would love me to explain to everyone who ever hears this myth that it's not because um, they, they didn't have pockets. Actually, even without pockets, there are many ways of secreting things about the, um, about the kimono. Not least, um, uh, you've, got, you've actually got the way the sleeves are sewn, it's perfectly possible to put things in the sleeve and carry them in the sleeve. Also, um, particularly with women, because the, the obi, the belt, is worn quite high, you will frequently see women today when they're wearing okimono in Japan who have quite a lot of things tucked into, into the top part of their kimono because it's actually held in place quite company that, that functions as a pocket. Men, it's not quite so simple as that because uh, actually they're wearing, traditionally Japanese man wears his belt much lower. In fact, the typical thing, I've worn a kimono myself, and the typical thing is for a man to be a little bit proud of his stomach. So he his, has his stomach here and often the, the, the obi is here. But it doesn't mean, you can still tuck things in there and they will sit there quite happily. So this thing about the kimono not having pockets is a little bit of an urban myth. But I think the fact is that, uh, that, that the Japanese liked, um, liked sagimono. I mean, they are, in times of uh, sumptuary laws where um, sort of conspicuous wealth was a little bit frowned on, um, clothing was often quite simple. It was your one way of expressing your style. Um, and I think that if you were a, a wealthy townsman, you know, you would go out with your mates and you would, uh, you would sit down having a drink or a meal or whatever, and the first thing I'm sure they did was to, to all take off their sagamona and um, they'd start passing them around. Um, you know, there was a little bit of showing off involved and a um, little bit of, you know, showing off your good taste as well. Um, and I think that that is quite an important part of what this is about. Now, so there you've got, there you've got the, the classic, simple, uh, in row, you've, uh, you know, you've got a, a pretty simple manju netsuke, or a, actually quite a, an elaborate manju netsuke, but a manju netsuke, a bun-shaped uh, netsuke which hangs over your obi, you've got the little ojime which helps to keep the thing closed, and you've got a, a, an in row, the function of which, more often than not, I mean, they sometimes say that people carried snacks around in them. Um, if they did, they were very small snacks because an in row is not very big, um, but principally they carried, carried medicines, and um, if... Uh, uh, if my wife is anything to judge by, my Japanese wife is anything to judge by, she is a hypochondriac. I've never seen so many pills and powders in my life. And I think that, um, you know, the Japanese have long liked pills and powders. And so having the, the little box that you could carry around with five or six different, um, different medicaments about your person was quite a useful thing. Now, I don't know whether anyone's done a study on this, but I'm, I'm quite interested in the, in, the, um, in the sort of history of... Um, how these things were worn. It, it seems to me, this is what, what I'm showing you now is, a, is a one leaf from an album in the British Museum. It's a 17th century album, so 17th century paintings. And it shows a very much more elaborate um, set of um, sagemono, or things attached to, to or hanging from the belt, than what I've just shown you previously. Um, sort of trying to deconstruct it, um, my interpretation is that the netsuke here is the gourd-shaped, the white gourd-shaped thing towards the top. Um, but it's then attached along the way to a seal, and it's quite, you understand why somebody would want to have a seal. I mean, to this day, the Japanese um, use seals quite importantly. Quite often you sign a check in Japan with a seal, with your hanko, uh, and not, and not um, with, you know, with, a, with your signature. So seals have been important for a long time. There's a pouch there, a cloth pouch, which, I mean, it could have contained anything, but let's assume for the moment that it's a, um, uh, a money pouch. Um, and, of course, an in-row. Now, I think that this was, given the date of this painting from the, quite early in the 17th century, I think that this sort of elaborate uh, configuration, I mean, all the... I can't remember how many sheets there are in this album, but it's at, at least 10 from memory. And each one is of a very, very elaborate combination like this. I'm sorry not to, to have more to show you. Um, this is a box that we had when I was at Sydney, Mo uh, at Sydney Moss. I actually bought and sold this box. It's, um, it's not particularly early. It's signed by Kan Shorsai. It's probably early 19th century. But here again, you see on the side of the box, you see uh, one in row, 
with a pouch, and they're in fact joined to, to one Netsky around the corner, a uh, simple one of uh, maple leaves. And I think that this, it may not have, well actually it's, it's interesting that on this box you've got the two styles of wearing an inrow, because on top you've got the simpler version with the, simply the, the Netsky, the Ojime, and the inrow. But I think that this, my suspicion is that this thing of, of attaching two or more sagemono to the Netsky was possibly quite a common thing throughout the 17th and maybe through quite a lot of the 18th century as well. By the 19th century, I suspect it had been given up, but um, uh, it's, a, it, it's something I, I would like to do more work on myself. Uh, this is a, a late 18th century Netsky, which I had uh, a short while ago for sale. Um, it's by uh, Hidemasa. It's from the early, well, it's probably around 1800 in date, but here we have, in Netsky form, an illustration of the same thing. You see you've got the, the, the same sort of pouch, uh, small in-row, uh, a classic Kyoto-style um, Netsky of an ox, and you'll see there's an ojime on both sides, so each of the, the in-row and the pouch each has its own ojime to, to keep it closed. Um, but it's quite interesting to see that in um, you know, uh, just another iconographic demonstration of this style of wearing I won't bang on about Inro for too long because this is supposed to be a talk about Netsky, but um, uh, another aspect of them which interests me is that um, we know for, with, with some certainty that Inro were adopted very, very early in the, 16, in, the, sorry, in the 17th century. They probably existed already by the end of the 1500s. Um, the earliest datable Inro is this one here. I'm sorry it's such a bad illustration, but that's the only one I can find so far of it. But this, was, this particular inro was buried with this man, Date Masamune, in 1636. So we know for certain that inro existed by that date. And judging by the style of it, which is rather different from the previous slide, um, my assumption and the assumption of most people who um, take an interest in inro is that this particular style of inro was about the earliest. But um, it, it sort of... Uh, fairly typical to have, I mean, uh, when, it was, when it was first made, all the um, black chrysanthemum flowers there would in fact have been um, high relief takamakie, um, high relief um, pictorial lacquer. Um, it, it looks the way it does now because of course the top surface has been rubbed away with centuries of use. But um, they're very attractive things and um, really not even very expensive to buy. You can still find these for hundreds of euros rather than rather than thousands. Um, the curious thing is that we, we know, as I say, that Inro were already around in the early 17th century, probably as early 1600 or a bit before. But nobody dares very much to date Netsky before about 1700. Um, I think that may be in part because the very first Netsky may have been very, very simple objects. I mean, they may almost have been objets trouvés, pleasing. Ja the Japanese like materials, and I think that they probably appreciated a, you know, a, a well-formed piece of stone or simple pieces of stag antler or bone or coral, any other exotic material that came their way. If it had a pleasing shape and if it served to, to hold the inro or other sagemono in place, it served as a, as a Netsuke. And it may be that not many of those have survived because they were superseded by, by what came later in Netsuke. But it's generally assumed that the, the, the first um, katabori Netsuke, the first um, uh, sculptural Netsuke, if you like, um, were things of this type. Um, this, is, this is a type known as uh, tobori. Um, it's almost certainly copied from a Chinese ori original, um, copied from, a, uh, from a, Ming, a Ming ivory. There is some debate whether some of the Tobori Netsuki are not actually Chinese. I happen to describe, it's a, it's a matter of, it be difficult to convince you one way or the other, but um, I think they're Japanese. But knowing the, the Japanese reverence for things which came from China, I don't see it as, um, actually I think it's quite likely that, um, that Japanese, sorry, that Chinese toggles could have been adopted in Japan for use as Netsuke. Um, and indeed, it's quite possible that Ming carvings of this type were used as Netsuke. But I think fairly soon on, 
the Japanese started copying them themselves. Um, this one, I think, has all the, 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 the crackelure that you see there um, simply through age and the nature of this particular piece of ivory, though quite often uh, Chinese ivories seem to become much more crackled than the Japanese ones. I have no idea why that is, but in some ways, while I believe that that is Japanese, it starts in, in all its crackling, it has some of the characteristics of a, of a, of a Chinese um, carving. Um, another early type was almost certainly, I'm sorry I don't have any um, illustrations of paintings, but um, this, uh, the word kuruma literally means wheel in Japanese. Um, I think these may have been adapted. They, they were, oh, this, is a, this is one, uh, obviously, that's been um, carved as a dragon. Quite often, they are simple disks of, uh, or uh, rings of, of ivory. Um, they may well have come from priests' robes. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with uh, Japanese priests' robes, but they often have a, a, an ivory disk here which serves to, to close the robe. And again, I'm sorry not to have an illustration of that. Um, this is an ad adaptation of that. Now, I don't think that when these were worn as Netsuki that they were necessarily... I don't think the obi necessarily went through it, though it would be perfectly possible. A man's obi is, is much thinner, it's narrower. A woman's obi is normally about that, that height, whereas a man's one is, is, is like that. So a, a male obi would easily thread through that, but I think actually what you did was to, to, to just pull it up through, um, through, your, um, through your obi and then have things attached to it. But um, this was one style early on in the 18th century. And because they were just plain discs, it, that may explain why, um, why they, didn't, they haven't survived in great number, because um, subsequently they would have struck people as being rather ordinary and of no consequence. But you do find them from time to time, not as often as you would think. Um, another style, this is actually a much later Netsuki um, by an artist I admire greatly, and I'm sorry, well, it, I suppose it's, the quality is not too bad. This is a big thing. I mean, that, that is about that size. And um, just as I was saying that um, uh, originally, I think that the, the earliest Netsuki were possibly objet trouvé. They were also, there's a tradition of turning in Japan. If you know what I mean by turning, it's, you know, when you use a lathe to, to, um, uh, to cut um, circular shaped objects. And so to, to, turn, uh, to turn a piece of ivory, a simple piece of ivory, and make um, either what they call a manju, a bun shaped, um, uh, Netsuki, um, which you do see quite often or from time to time in 17th century paintings and prints. Um, so I think there was a tradition of turning um, and of course the Japanese uh, adopted smoking fairly early on, they loved tobacco and um, quite often they, they wore Netsuki which also functioned as um, ashtrays. Um, so um, that would explain this sort of shape. I mean, you could literally, you could hold that and tap out your, your, your pipe and make sure that your, um, that your lighter tobacco didn't fall on the tatami mat, which would be uh, slightly disastrous. Um, here's another um, of these early um, katabori, uh, tabori types. Um, once they get into carving sculpturally, which seems to have taken off in the 18th century. As I say, we have no, we have no dated Netsuki to really um, uh, hang the whole dating of Netsuki onto. I'll come on to, there is a key date later in the 18th century, but already by then, Netsuki are quite, uh, sculptural Netsuki are quite developed. But um, I think just through guesswork and by uh, comparison, um, people who follow Netsuki have a sort of, each of us, ends up with our own sort, of, uh, own sort of dating. I have a feeling that we probably need to take the, the dating of those early Tobori Netsuki back into the 17th century because I cannot believe that there's 100 years without sculptural Netsuki in, in any significant numbers. Um, so sooner or later, we probably have to come to terms with that. Um, nonetheless, the, the, the earlier uh, Netsuki uh, tend to take their uh, subjects from... Uh, from China, Chinese subjects, Chinese mythology. This, this chap is absolutely huge. This is one I, I sold a year ago. He's deceptively large. He, he's that sort of size and, you know, really, really, really substantial. And he's one of the bigger um, tall Netskis that I have. As a, as a curious diversion, there is a body of opinion. There are 
people in Japan who are convinced that the tall net ski, which I'm about to show you in the next few slides, are a Meiji fiction. They are convinced that these, all of these netsuke were made in the uh, late 19th century to um, deceive foreigners in their enthusiasm for things Japanese. I'm afraid I don't subscribe to that view at all. I think that there, are, there is something about the feel of an 18th century netsuke in terms of, its, of its, the, the, the patina, the wear. Um, it couldn't be anything else but 18th century. So uh, I'm taking it as given that all these ones I'm about to show you are indeed 18th century. Um, this is one that, uh, that I had recently, um, less substantial than the other one. This is a, this is a Senin, um, uh, a mountain hermit. They're always um, uh, distinguishable by their, um, their, usually their skirts or their cloaks made of mugwort leaves. Um, and there's a whole, um, you know, there's a whole iconography of, of Senin. You can recognize the different Senin by their, by their att attributes. This is the, um, the peach senin. I don't know, it's not. He's carrying a, a peony. I'm not sure which senin he is, actually. This is a, a beautiful, early-ish 18th century netsuke. And actually, very interesting. I can't show it to you in a slide. It was so beautifully, the mouth was so beautifully hollowed out that actually the light was coming through the head. And when you looked into the mouth, there was actually a glow in the mouth from the light. It was quite extraordinary bit of carving. Uh, this is another senin. This is, um, this is by uh, great... Uh, late 18th century artist Tsuji, uh, really quite small. I mean, we're going from things that, about that big to something really very tiny and delicate. This, this particular senin, uh, Tekai, blows out his soul. And quite often he's depicted, there's a wonderful depiction in, um, in a Yoshinaga uh, Netsuke, which I've handled before, where he's lying down and he's blowing out his soul. And you can see that the, the, the soul is sort of almost like a, a gush of water which goes over his shoulder. And then his little soul is a, is a pilgrim sort of walking off into the distance on this. And here, the, 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 the breath is, is, has a physical presence, this, this little strand going up to his hand. And, and the, his soul is just a little, again, a little homunculus disappearing uh, up into space. Um, this is probably a depiction of uh, Shoki on the left, the demon queller. Um, but his, his appearance and his clothes are... Um, supposed to be exotic, foreign, Chinese, uh, strange. A lot of attention going to the detail of his, of his clothing, which is not in the least bit um, Japanese. Um, uh, Chinese mythological, myth mythological beings are obviously quite important. They're adopted um, on a regular basis. Here's a, this is a, uh, a, a dragon fish, conjoined dragons. Uh, this is a, again, this is, a, uh, this is sort of slightly out of date sequence, but um, it's, uh, it's quite nice to see the Japanese adopting a, um, uh, a, a very old uh, Chinese theme. Uh, this, is, this is, of course, a, a carp jumping a waterfall, for a waterfall, but it has um, much greater significance in Chinese and Japanese um, cultures than, than the simple act. It's, it's not just a depiction from nature, if you like. Um, this, this story is associated with the taking of um, uh, the equivalent of civil service exams in China, in ancient China. And, um, you know, you, you had this great waterfall to surmount in taking these exams. And if you passed, then you were quite often given a painting or something with this, this sort of imagery. Um, what you can't see in this slide, it's, it's very nice if you turn this Netsuke to one side, um, it's actually pierced on both, well, on both sides, um, you can see inside, and on the inside is a little carp falling down. So this is the one, this is the one that's failed. So the, the, you know, the meaning is there that it's not, it's not everyone who manages to succeed in these exams. And um, the Japanese, Japanese netsuke carvers love this sort of um, trickery, if you like, because there's no way... Uh, the artist, or the, the, yes, the artist wants us to believe that he's carved this little um, carp on the inside from the outside, but not a bit of it. Um, in fact, uh, with, I've seen a number of these, and um, they don't always have the carp inside. They've lost them along the way. But what he actually did was to, uh, he, he cut a section off the top, he carved the little carp separately, 
he put it inside, probably stuck it inside, and then he, he put the top back on, but carefully made sure that the, the join couldn't be seen, so that you think he's done this clever bit of carving. Um, very Japanese. Um, while I've got his name up there, I should say there are... There are uh, the name Masanao is a little bit confusing. I'm going to come on later to, to the great Masanao, the, the 18th century carver, Masanao of Kyoto. But there is another family of uh, Masanao carvers in a, in a different area of Japan, in Yamada Ise. Uh, they're very good carvers, but they, um, they're a long dynasty. I mean, they started in the mid-19th century, and there is a, there's a carver, there's a descendant of the family still carving today. Um, uh, competent carvers, but doing something different from uh, Masanao of Kyoto, as you will, as you will see. Um, also, I should perhaps say that the, the concept of a, of a family of carvers or family of any, art, any sort of artisan in, in Japan is quite an interesting one because it's not, it's not necessarily the case that um, although you have these lines of makers um, passing from master to apprentice uh, over several generations, it's not necessarily strictly family. Um, it's quite possible for a, a good master to find that his son is not up, doesn't meet his exacting standards, and therefore he invites uh, a boy in from somewhere else, somebody, a boy who has more talent than his own son, and if that talent is realised, it's that, it's that adopted son who takes the name. So when we talk of families, it's, a, it's, it's used in a slightly loose term, but it's a very good way of ensuring that um, the quality of craftsmanship passes down over... Uh, several generations. Um, so the, the, the Japanese in the early Netsuke carvers enjoyed um, subjects. Um, this is uh, a creature called a Kariobinga, uh, which is uh, sort of part human, part birds. They like, they like these creatures which are um, uh, half human or part human, part, part animal. Um, this is uh, probably adopted from, uh, from India from, uh, uh, with, with Buddhism. Um, but beautiful 18th century carving. Actually, very Chinese sort of uh, he uh, headdress. But it becomes confused. A lot of these mythical, legendary creatures become confused in the Japanese mind. Um, that, as you can see, there are quite a lot of similarities. In fact, it's quite probably a carver of this Netsuke who went on to carve this Netsuke, and uh, it's sort of confused imagery. Um, what we have here is, in fact, uh, a Tengu, uh, who is half man, uh, half bird, uh, a, a mountain-dwelling uh, warrior. Um, but as I say, it's probably from the, from the, same, from the same group of carvers. Um, and I suspect even that this, um, this mermaid uh, is, is from... Uh, similar stable of carvers as well. So you've got sort of, um, uh, you know, the half, the half fish and the half bird all, all being grouped together. But they, uh, at this time, they love these, um, these weird, inexplicable creatures. Um, they also adopt, uh, you know, straight mythical animals from, from China. This is a, so I'm sorry, slightly poor, well, uh, you know, slightly feeble slide, I'm sorry. It's... Um, that is probably by uh, Tomatada, one of the great 18th century uh, carvers from Kyoto. Uh, pretty successful uh, kilin, uh, chimera. Uh, a lot of these creatures, um, even, even some of the best of them, are a little bit stiff. They have a bit of a problem with the front legs. They often end up being a little bit straight and rigid. This is more successful because he's managed to... Well, you can see the, the leg behind is still a little bit straight and stiff, but he's managed to the artists managed to introduce some, um, some movement into that um, uh, left leg and nice serpentine shape to the body. Uh, this is another favourite of theirs, a, a baku, which is a sort of slightly elephant-like creature. It has, it has the trunk of an elephant, but as you can see, it's got, the, it's got things in common with... Uh, well, you see it's got a similar sort of tail. A lot of these legendary beasts end up with with things in common. So you can see these two creatures have the same sort of tail. And um, do you see the sort of bobbly um, effect, almost like cellulite, particularly on the hind leg, but also, I mean, you've got, I suppose you've got vertebrae being expressed there, but this back leg, you've got these sort of fatty elements. Um, you sometimes see those, it's not present in this particular um, uh, Kirin, but you quite often get that on the legs of the Kirin as well. 
but you note that the body, the body here is covered in scales, um, and it's got a sort of, it's got a neck almost like a snake or a, or a, um, an alligator. Uh, Baku have the, the great quality of uh, swallowing dreams. Um, this, I think they swallow both bad and good dreams, but um, uh, quite often Japanese pillows had uh, an image of a, of a baku at either end to um, bring good sleep. There are a couple of more, a couple more um, impressive, uh, impressive baku. But um, I mean, you, you find elephants in, in Netsuki as well. I don't think I've got photos of any today, but um, really the distinguishing features is that an elephant would not have these wonderful bushy tails and manes. Um, but it, clearly when you get to the trunk, um, it's hard to distinguish the two. And also, um, you see these flames that are coming. You sort of have flames emanating uh, at the neck and uh, the, the hind leg. You get those on Kirin. There they are. And uh, quite often on Baku, though. Uh, well, you got on that Baku, but not on these. So the artists themselves are sometimes a little bit confused by the iconography. Here are three more weird uh, Japanese creatures. Um, here we're beginning to get away from the Chinese and more into the native um, Japanese mythical creatures. Um, the one on the right is, uh, is uh, Tengu, um, Ten Tenjin Sanjin, a uh, sort of mountain living uh, creature, again with scaly skin and a tail that comes between his legs uh, and slightly humanoid um, head. Uh, the middle one is a Tengu. Uh, this particular Tengu seems to be more bird than, than man. Um, and on the left, you've got a, uh, a kappa, a uh, water living creature, more normally shown hugging a cucumber. They love cucumbers, and that's how they're normally um, shown, but here he is hugging a fish. Um, the, the kappa uh, has its vital fluids in a sort of open pool on its head, and uh, they're, they're very vicious creatures, but also very polite. And, um, Supposedly, if you're attacked by a, a kappa, the thing to do is to bow because they feel bound to bow back, and in so doing, the vital fluid pours out of the rece recipient on their <laughs> head, and they they can't um, do their evil anymore. And that's uh, that's another tengu. This is a, a very popular subject of um, uh, of uh, Netsuki. This is the hatching tengu, and again, he's more in this particular instance, he's more more bird than man, I would say. Uh, that's by Toyomasa, who's one of the great, uh, well, great, Toyomasa the first, Toyomasa the second, this is probably Toyomasa the second, but he's one of the great uh, carvers of Tamba. Uh, more exoticism. Um, because the Japanese didn't get to see too many foreigners, um, as you probably know, uh, after a short um, spell, the Portuguese were banned from uh, Japan entirely. Um, at the end of the 17th century. And um, the Dutch, although they were allowed to stay on, uh, were restricted to the island of, of Deshima um, and the Chinese to a neighboring island just, uh, just off Nagasaki, which meant that um, most Japanese did not get to see foreigners and it, made, it meant that foreigners were of great um, speculative interest. They were uh, as exotic as all these um, strange creatures uh, depicted in, in, uh, you know, in the tri Chinese tradition. Um, so sometimes, because the carvers themselves were, didn't know firsthand what they were carving, there seems to be sort of icono iconographic confusion. But I, my guess would be, particularly judging from the clothes, that most of these um, three are, are meant to be Chinese. Certainly, um, the dress is pretty Chinese, though having said that, the, the long coat ridden, uh, um, worn by the chap in the center has these wave motifs along the bottom and quite often Dutchmen, I can't remember whether I've got any slides of Dutchmen, but Dutchmen were depicted quite often and they frequently wore long coats which you would recognize as European coats, frock coats, um, but frequently with these sort of wave motifs over the bottom and I think that's because they associated the Dutch with the sea and so they were probably meant to be um, sea captains or whatever. But uh, I think judging from, from that long, the, the style of that long coat and the hat, that is meant to be a Chinese. But sometimes you're left in doubt. Um, 
This chap on the right is clearly derived from a Dutchman. I think you can see that's much more of a... Um, that's more, much more of a... Well, e even that coat, I think, is a bit of a hybrid. Um, he is, he's meant to be a monkey trainer, but he's got, he's got uh, the hair or wig of a, of a Dutchman. So that's probably a bit of a hybrid. I mean, most the monkey trainers normally were native Japanese, um, though the Dutchmen were quite frequently, when you see a depiction of a, of a Dutchman, it's carrying an animal of some sort, um, either a dog over his shoulders, sometimes a boar, uh, a hare, or quite often carrying a cockerel or a, um, uh, or a crane. It's thought that the reason they're shown uh, sh carrying cranes is that they... Uh, the Dutch frequently travelled with um, cassowaries, um, big birds, on their, on their boats. And that because the Japanese themselves didn't understand what a cassowary was, they, they depicted the only thing they knew that which was similar, which would have been a, a, a crane. And the chap on the left, I have to say, I don't know quite what nationality he's supposed to be. But he's perhaps not even a foreigner. He may just be a performer of some sort, but um, there you are. Uh, this chap is another another foreigner, probably a sort of confused, confused one at that. I mean, he's got, he's got sort of lank European type hair, but his dress is very, very Chinese in spirit, quite what he's meant to be. I don't know. He could even be a, um, a South Sea Islander of sorts. But, um, you know, when it came to depicting foreigners, accuracy was not what it was about. It was, it was conveying the idea of exoticism. Um, the Japanese also liked um, to have their erotic fantasy in, in, in Netsuke. This is, this is probably carved in Japan, though it's clearly derived from a Chinese doctor's model. I have seen uh, Chinese doctor's models which have been adapted for use as Netsuke. In other words, um, they have had some sort of uh, attachment. The, the one I particularly remember had a, a, a silver loop attached to the back to make it into a Netsuke, but it had started its life as a Chinese doctor's model. This one, I suspect, it's, it's a bit too, um, dare I say, it's a bit too sexy to have been carved in China, uh, to my eyes. I think this is carved in Japan, um, but following the idea of, of, a, of a doctor's model. So it's an adaptation. Um, the, these are diving girls, ama, um, who traditionally, I mean, actually, even in the 20th century, perhaps even today, um, always um, uh, dived um, bare-breasted. And uh, so they're the sort of stuff of erotic fantasy. Um, and quite often, um, they, are, uh, they are depicted in Netsuki as um, having a bit of a struggle with an octopus. Um, the octopus seems to be a sort of... Um, thing of Japanese erotic fantasy. Um, some of you may be familiar with the great Hokusai of the octopus ravishing a woman. Um, but in Netsuke, you see this, this quite often. And um, where are those tentacles? Uh, oni are demons. Um, but they're not really the devils. They're not normally, certainly in Netsuke, they're rarely the devils of, um, of Western religious uh, iconography. Uh, they're a sort of, uh, they're more mischievous than malign. Um, so here you see one hiding behind a very severe mask, but you can see that behind, behind that mask, he's got a slightly sheepish expression. Um, not at all, um, he's not quite as, uh, as fierce or as menacing as he would have us believe. And, um, you know, I think these are really docile putty, pussy cats of, uh, of demons. They're not, they're not the stuff... Uh, of uh, nightmares. Uh, they're sort of bored. They looked, well, the one in the middle looks bored. The one on the, um, the, one on the left and the one on the right both look a bit frightened themselves. So um, they've, they've got demons to scare them. Uh, those are all 18th century, again. Uh, three more, again, um, I don't think they're going to pose us with any threat or give us any trouble. Um, now, I was talking about dating. And there is, there's only one major publication which helps us with, in some way or in any way, with the dating of Netsuke. And this is the, uh, uh, sorry, it's actually, I've put Sōshen Kiko, it's, this, it, uh, it's the Sōken Kisho, I beg your pardon. Um, published in 1781 in, uh, in Osaka, um, which is 
little more than a list of known carvers of the time, uh, carvers of reputation, with a few comments about what they, what they carved and um, uh, in some cases some line drawings giving some subjects uh, of, um, uh, of those particular carvers. Although this is not signed, this is a huge piece again. Uh, some people think it's an okimono, in other words, a, a sculpture rather than a netsuke. But I'll show you the back in a second. But that was that big and really quite, quite bulky. Although it's not signed, uh, I did attribute it to uh, Sanko, who is one of the artists um, listed in, in the Soken Kisho. Uh, there's the back of it. Um, you can see that it, it does have holes which function as himatoshi for, for attaching cords. But um, whether or not, uh, you know, it's open to debate. But uh, that is probably... Uh, a Netsky of the type that one can date to 1780 or before. I mean, probably 1750 to 1780. Um, another of the carvers listed in Soken Kisho is uh, uh, Tomatada, uh, who is one of the great, uh, particularly animal carvers of the uh, late 18th century. Um, while Kyoto is associated with realistic animals, I think it would be mistaken to pretend that this is a, a realistic representation of horse, but it's a very graceful conception of a horse. But Tomatada is one of the, he's one of the most copied artists of the 18th century. That signature is one that one sees frequently, particularly on, on oxen. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the Netsuke which carry his name are not probably by him, but that, that is thought to be by him. Uh, that is a, a goat by him. And again, I would argue that, um, uh, that it's not necessarily a naturalistic representation. It's more, uh, you know, it's a slightly... Um, you know, it's, it's rather a sweet creature with a, with a bit of a smile to it. Um, there's the signature again. Um, this is another of the great carvers listed in the Soken Kisho. This is Masanao of Kyoto, um, another uh, hatching tengu. Uh, but that's, you know, that's one of the absolute classics of the 18th century of that subject. That's what his signature looks like. Much copied. Uh, quite interesting. I mean, one could go on at length about the way these himatoshi, these holes are carved. But one of the features of... Uh, Masanao is that he norm nearly always has, uh, well, it's an 18th century feature to have a smaller and larger hole, but his are always one small round and one large oval and then deeply, deeply excavated inside, so you can get a large knot in there if you need to. Um, this is Okatomo, who is uh, one of the pupils of Tomotada, and I think here you can see already that one's moving away from the, the sort of slightly stylized towards the more naturalistic representation. That's a beautiful representation of a, of a dog. Uh, that's uh, Masanao again, wonderful rat with his great um, uh, eyes and inlaid horn. Uh, and that is a pupil of, uh, that's a follower of Tomatara, that's Okatori. But I think that's absolutely wonderful naturalism. I mean, there you're really getting um, very sensitive uh, representation of reality and animals. That's Masanao again with a horse. Uh, same features, you can actually get a sense of how deeply excavated that uh, uh, Himatoshi is there. And well, I think one of the features of the great 18th century carvers, particularly these um, recumbent animals, a good Masanao, a good Tomotada, is not just flat on the bottom. It has a, it's not just that it's, it's not just that the legs are nicely carved, but also there's a roundness, there's, a, there's curvature in, in all directions to the underside, whereas the, the poorer copies tend to be very flat on the underneath. I think it's a good sign of whether it's a, it's a good 18th century carving. That is the most uh, famous Snetsky in the world currently. That's the Masatoshi um, hair with amber eyes, the subject of uh, Edmund de Waal's book. Uh, of course, the Japanese have a bit of a problem when it comes to, to representing a real animal, but a real animal which they haven't seen. Um, so, uh, you know, they don't know tigers. They only know tigers from representations in paintings. And uh, so they end up being um, more the idea of a tiger than the real representation of a tiger. Uh, and I think this brings me to a feature of Japanese art, which is that they quite like to cartoonize. Um, so if you don't know a tiger, what do you do with it? You, you make it into a figure of fun. And I, can, I think you can see that these are all slightly humorous approaches. These are more pussycats than, than uh, fierce tigers. I mean, the one on the right is quite, he's trying to be fierce, but somehow he's, you know, not entirely convincing with it. Um, and there you have uh, Shishi doing much the same thing. 18th century dog, the same thing. This is more Disney than real dog. Um, a toad, it's sort of, 
yes, it's a good representation of a toad, but at the same time, there's something going on with that mouth which makes it uh, a little closer to cartoon and uh, manga. Um, you know, you've got an element of humour being introduced to it here with, uh, this is one of the great uh, Hida Takayama carvers, Sukinaga, and um, you know, wonderful, in some ways, wonderful realistic representation of all the warts and skin of toads, but then the humour with this leg which is pressing down on the eye of, of uh, the toad below, which is therefore having to close the eye, whereas the other one on the other side is wide open. Um, these shishi are, again, you know, a bit like the oni. They're not fierce. They're, um, they're sort of uh, pussycat shishi. They're not going to frighten anyone. Um, I mean, humor is, is quite a big element of uh, Japanese art. This is Okame, who's a, a figure of fun. She represents, you know, she's, a, uh, she's, not, a, she's not a beauty. She's, um, she's a bit of an ugly woman, but she likes life and she likes sex and she sees sex in everything, not least in mushrooms. Um, so she always gets excited when she sees a long-nosed mask or a, or a mushroom. Um, these temple guardians, uh, Nio, um, have been brought out of their sentry boxes and uh, are having a, an arm wrestling match. Uh, so nice bit of fantasy and, uh, and humor and imagination all, in, all rolled into one. Rare artist Higo Daijo. Here you have two representations of uh, Daruma, the patriarch, uh, Buddhist patriarch, meditating for nine years, looking very unhappy on the right, enveloped in his robe. And um, on the left, I think he must be coming out of his meditation and he looks like somebody with a bad hangover. <coughs> and the uh, chap in the middle is one of the lucky gods, Fukurokuju. Um, you know, good, friendly sort of fellow. That's uh, Hote, Putai from China. Uh, again, you know, a uh, lucky god and uh, he's represented as a well-fed, over-fat, um, Fatty chap. Uh, the macabre is another element that the Japanese like. Severed head, um, pretty. Ari, how, how much longer do I have? Well, the, the only book I'll see is right. So ah, yes. five minutes? <laughs> five minutes, okay. Well, I'll try and get through this as quickly as possible. Sorry, I, I, uh, <laughs> I could have shown you a lot more. Um, if anyone would like to, to, to stay behind and go somewhere, I'm happy to run through these on the screen and I can, I can show you more. But... Uh, uh, in all events, I, I hope that I've given you a taste for what's good in Netsuke. Um, I, uh, I, I have with me the catalogue of an exhibition that my business partner, Rosemary uh, Bandini, has curated in the Embassy of Japan in London, um, which is one of the greatest assemblage of Netsuke's um, from private collections seen together in a long, long time. So if anyone would like to see that, do, do come and see me. And um, I'll be happy to, as I say, to talk about Netsuke with anyone who wants to or to show you more on, on my computer. Yeah? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.